This is the Academy Award winning actress Joan Crawford. Although she was world famous public figure for years, little of the true story of her private life was known until after her death. Joan Crawford was born Lucille Fay Lesseur sometime around March the 23rd, 1905. The exact year of her birth is still in question. Lucille had one older sister, Daisy, that died very young. She had one brother, Hal, who was a couple years older than Lucille. They were born in San Antonio, Texas to Thomas Lesseur and Annabelle Johnson. Thomas left the family shortly after Lucille was born. Now this is a family portrait taken before Lucille's birth. Thomas is standing on the back row. Her mother Annabelle is holding her brother Hal and Lucille's grandmother is holding her sister Daisy. After Thomas, Lucille's dad left the family, they were almost destitute. Now this is Lucille and her mother in 1913 when she was around eight or nine years old. An embittered Annabelle takes the children and moves to Lawton, Oklahoma, away from Thomas's family. And four years after moving to Lawton, Annabelle meets theater operator and opera house owner, Henry Casson. They believe to have been married in 1908. Lucille considered Casson to be her real dad until told different at the age 11 by her brother Hal. Casson paid for Lucille's dance lessons and let her hang around the theater people and encouraged her. She stated years later that she guessed if she gave credit to any of the people that helped her the most, he would have to be at the top of the list even after all these years. In 1916, the family left Lawton for Kansas City, where Casson paid for tuition to enroll Lucille in the St. Agnes Academy. But after Casson left the family, she stayed as a working student, washing, cooking, cleaning, and making beds for some 30 other students that often made fun of her. She won a dance contest when she was 13 and attended Rockingham Academy and was sponsored by one of her teachers. She entered Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri for four months before quitting. Now this is a picture of Lucille, her mother, and brother Hal while she was enrolled in Stevens College in 1922. She worked as a sales girl till she could get enough money to go to Chicago where she found work dancing in nightclubs. She eventually was offered a job in a Broadway course line. At the age of 19, she was spotted by an MGM talent scout and offered a train ticket and a six month contract, making almost $75 per week. In 1926, she was playing bit parts and using her real name, Lucille Lasore. The studio changed her name to Joan Crawford, which she disliked, said that Crawford sounded too much like crawfish. And in 1928, Joan danced her way into the hearts of the flapper generation in Dancing Daughters, here with Dorothy Sebastian. Also in 1928, Joan was cast opposite Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in the film Our Modern Maidens. She was around 25 years old at the time. It was said that Crawford was extremely ambitious and had a plan to reach the top, but who in Hollywood didn't? Of course, the famous Hollywood family, the Fairbankses, was a great stepping stone for Joan. Douglas was so taken with Joan that he asked her to marry him, and they were married June the 3rd, 1929. And about that time is when Joan bought this house at 246 North Bristol in Brentwood, where she lived for many, many years. By 1931, Joan was becoming a major star and earning more money than she had ever had. That year, Joan starred with leading man Clark Gable. Soon a romance developed between Gable and Crawford. Eventually, Fairbanks found out and in 1933, they were divorced. 
Now that was the same year that she co-starred with French O'Tone in Today We Live. Now through the years, everyone in Hollywood was aware of the feud between Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. Now there are several stories as to what caused this lasting feud. Aside from the normal professional jealousy, the one that seems the most plausible to me is this. Betty Davis had also co-starred with French O'Tone, and it had been said that she fell madly in love with him. Unfortunately, Davis was married at the time, so it seemed that competition between Davis and Crawford developed for the affections of Tone. Well, Joan went in by marrying him in 1935. Davis, believing that Crawford never loved him and only used him, and married him partly to spite her. Now this may or may not have been true. However, whatever it was, it was serious enough the feud would last for a lifetime. During this period, a sex film claiming to be of Joan Crawford was taken to the studio. Now it was plainly not Joan. Louis B. Mayer said after watching the film, if that's Joan Crawford that I'm Greta Garbo. Not a dime was to be paid to the blackmailers. By 1939, Joan's films was losing money, and she was considered box office poison. That same year, she divorced French O'Tone, and it's believed that Joan had several miscarriages during their marriage. So in 1940, after trying to adopt a child in California, but was refused for being a single parent and having several divorces, she was able to adopt Christina when she was only a few months old from out of state. Joan's first child, Christina, that she nicknamed Tina, was told that her mother died at childbirth, which wasn't true. Joan used a notorious Tennessee Children's Home Society run by Georgia Tan. Now, Georgia Tan had run a corrupt adoption agency that sometimes actually stole babies and sold them to wealthy people. If an adoption occurred in Tennessee, the state would only allow a small amount to be charged. But Georgia would sometimes carry children to another state and charge whatever she wanted to without the state of Tennessee ever knowing. Be it that Christina was the first child, she was legally adopted, and soon after her, Joan received another child she named Christopher. But Christopher's birth parents retrieved him from Joan because there was a paper trail. In 1943, Joan adopted another child, and she also named him Christopher. But this time, it's believed that Joan bought Christopher outright and all papers were either changed or destroyed, which was quite common practice for Georgia Tan. And by this time, Joan had married another actor, Philip Terry. By 1946, the marriage was over and Terry left before the divorce. Once Philip and Joan's divorce was final, so was his contact with the children. Now by this time, Joan's career was slipping and she would use the children to try and keep her name before the public. Joan's longtime secretary stated that Joan would dress the children up for photo shots and then wouldn't see them for a long spell. She also said the night raids of terror, the wired coal hanger episodes that Christina wrote about in her book, Mummy Dearest, sounded just like something Joan would do and her drinking, she knew, got worse. Joan, at 41, was going downhill fast and needed a perfect script to save her career. She got it that same year with the movie Mildred Pierce. Joan won the Academy Award and was back on top. In 1947, she acquired two more children from Georgia Tan, Kathy and Cynthia. Their mother had died in Dyersburg, Tennessee of kidney failure and their father abandoned the girls. Years later, Cynthia located her birth family in Memphis 
and will form a relationship with them. Cynthia will die of hepatitis infection while waiting for a liver transplant on October the 14th, 2007, at the age of 60. Also in 1947, Joan was nominated for Best Actress for Possessed. And in 1949, Joan sent Christina, age nine, and Christopher, age seven, to separate boarding schools. Now the relationship between Christopher and Christina developed from two young children trying to survive together. Their relationship will last for years until Christopher's death on September the 22nd, 2006 of cancer in Greenport, New York at the age of 62. In 1952, Joan again will be nominated for Best Actress for Sudden Fear. In 1955, Joan met Alfred Steele at a party and he quickly became infatuated with the movie star. In May, of 1956, they were married in Las Vegas. Steele was the head of directors of the board of Pepsi Cola and Company. And as soon as she married Steele, she shipped the twins off to boarding school. In 1958, Joan's mother, Anna, dies. Three years after marrying Steele in 1959, Alfred Steele dies at the age of 58 of a heart attack. During their marriage, Joan traveled with Steele representing Pepsi-Cola. He even had her appointed to the Pepsi board, which she remained until 1973, when they forced her to resign. In 1961, Joan invited her old rival, Betty Davis, to star with her in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Joan was enough of a businesswoman to realize the potential for a successful movie. Here they are on the set looking like two old friends, but don't believe it. There was always tension between the two on the set of Baby Jane. Joan was right, it was a good opportunity for them, especially for Davis, who received an Academy Award nomination for her part as Baby Jane. However, Joan again managed to upstage Davis by calling the other nominees and asking if she could accept the Oscar for them if Davis didn't win. Joan accepted the Oscar for Anne Bancroft for The Miracle Worker. Davis said she was shocked and couldn't believe it. Now they had actually planned another movie, a picture called Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, but Joan pulled out and Betty's best friend Olivia de Havilland took her part. On May the 3rd, 1963, Hal Hayes Lasore. Joan's brother dies of an erupted appendix. Hal had been in the general hospital in LA for eight days. It was said that Joan had sent him a telegram from New York where she was living. A spokesman for Joan said that she had helped to support him for 30 years. However, the people where Hal worked at the hotel as a clerk and part-time switchboard operator said he lived from paycheck to paycheck, that he dressed nice, he acted nice, he was quiet, especially when it come to talking about his famous sister. He's buried at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, and he lived in the hotel where he worked. He was believed to have been 59 years old. People that he worked for said his relationship with his sister was not good. In September of 1974, Joan agreed to host a party for her friend, Rosalind Russell. Several photographs were taken of Joan and Russell. The next day, she was shocked to see the photos of herself in the papers. Joan said, if that's the way I look, they've seen the last of me. She withdrew from the public appearances and became a partial recluse in her New York apartment. Two years later, Lucille Fay Lasseur, actress Joan Crawford, was dead. Her body was found in bed in her Upper East Side apartment. Some newspapers stated that her death was from a heart attack caused from cancer, but others said that she had given her beloved dog away a week earlier. 
and that she was found in her finest clothes, laying in her last and final pose. Instructions was given to have her body cremated and her ashes be placed in the vault with her late husband, Alfred Steele, at the Fern Cliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. It's believed that Joan was around 72 years old or thereabouts. Now, Joan managed to control her death as she had controlled her life, neat and tidy. In Joan's will, she left $77,000 to Cynthia and $77,000 to Kathy, her adopted twin daughters. She also left Kathy her personal items, including her Oscar that Joan had won for Mildred Pierce. Kathy later will have the Oscar auctioned off for over $400,000. She left various other people smaller amounts. Well, the bulk of her $2 million estate left to charities. Christina and Christopher, she stated in her will, it is my intention to make no provisions here for my son Christopher or my daughter Christina for reasons which are well known to them. Now, there may be several reasons for this statement, and I don't pretend to know the answer. However, I do believe that Joan knew Christina was writing a tell-all book, and she believed that Christopher was conspiring with her. Although she did not know what was in the book, she did suspect it wasn't good, and actually had considered writing an answer with her own book. After Mummy Dears was released, everyone picked sides. Joan's friends in the movie industry thought that the book was only to make money for Christina and smear Joan's good name. However, it's quite different to know someone professionally from a working relationship as many of the movie stars did, or even as close friends or lovers. Her friends seen the kindness that Joan showed her second husband, French O'Tone, when he was sick and wheelchair bound. She took him in in his last days, even though he had married three more times after Joan. French O'Tone died of lung cancer the 18th of September, 1968. Joan made all the funeral arrangements and seen that his wishes were carried out. Now, no one can deny that this was a kind act shown by Joan Crawford. However, Kind acts shown to adults in the daylight are a lot different than being a small child at home awakened in the dark by a screaming mad woman and you without help.